Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class on Christology. Thank you all for uh, uh, joining class this morning. Uh, we'll begin. So, I'll request uh, any one of you to please lead us in prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer? Anyone? Thank you, Lord, for this, this uh, new day, Lord. You're great and you're awesome, Father God. We submit ourselves onto your loving hands, Father God. Help us, Lord. Help us to learn what she's teaching and use it in our lives, Lord. Jesus, we with you. Amen. Thank you, Nina Santosh. So this morning, we'll continue uh, looking at Chapter 11, uh, Christ's Resurrection and Exaltation. Uh, we looked at a uh, uh, few scripture verses that talked about Christ's resurrection, which was foretold in the Old Testament. Uh, we also looked at uh, the references in the Bible which where Jesus showed himself to be alive. And uh, we then I just started giving, uh, you know, sharing a few of uh, the notes that I had prepared on basically uh, the nature of Christ's resurrection, and then we looked at the doctrinal significance of the resurrection, uh, which is Christ's resurrection ensures uh, regeneration, Christ's resurrection ensures uh, justification, and Christ's resurrection ensures that we will receive perfect resurrected bodies as well. <clears throat> So uh, these uh, things which I mentioned, the nature of Christ's resurrection, uh, you know, the doctrinal significance of a resurrection, uh, which is Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration, our justification, and that we will receive perfect resurrection bodies uh, is not given in your notes. I just added because our notes was just very little with the... Uh, uh, just these points on, uh, you know, the resurrection foretold and how Jesus showed himself alive and just scripture verses. So I just added in a few more um, uh, verses, uh, I mean, a few more content uh, so that we can understand better Christ's resurrection and exaltation and what it means uh, to uh, us. Okay. Uh, the last thing we will look at in the doctrinal significance of the resurrection is the ethical significance of the resurrection. We began looking at this point last week, but we did not have enough time to finish it. So we will look at the ethical significance uh, of the resurrection. And since this uh, is not there in your notes, you would uh, like to take down these points. So the ethical significance of the resurrection. Now, Paul uh, you know, also sees that the resurrection has application to our obedience to God in this uh, life. So after, you know, a long discussion about resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul concludes this whole chapter that he's talking about resurrection in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, where he says, you know, uh, he's concluding by encouraging his leaders. And he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Okay, so he is basically encouraging them to be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. So it is because Christ was raised from the dead that we too shall be raised from the dead that uh, uh, and because we will be raised from the dead, we need to continue steadfastly in the Lord's work. That is what Paul is basically saying because he was talking about this entire chapter about resurrection. And so he's saying, because we have this hope that we'll be resurrected from the dead, you know, we too shall be raised from the dead. We need to continue uh, steadfastly, you know, immovable, always abounding in the Lord's work. Uh, this is because everything we do, you know, to build God's kingdom, everything that we do to share the gospel, everything that we do to, um, 
lead other people to Christ, you know, has eternal significance. So everything that we do to bring people into the kingdom of God, build them up in the faith, establish them in the faith, has eternal significance uh, because we all shall be raised on that day when Christ uh, returns and we shall live with him forever. So that is the first ethical significance of the resurrection, of the doctrinal significance of res resurrection. The second ethical significance is that, you know, Paul encourages us uh, when we think about the resurrection to focus on our future heavenly rewards as our goal. He sees uh, resurrection as a time when all the struggles of this life will be repaid. So even as uh, you, you know, build God's kingdom, minister, work hard, labor for the Lord, you know, sometimes you can get disappointed that, hey, you know, I'm doing so much, uh, there is no appreciation. Uh, all I get is uh, negative feedback. You have been done this, you have been done that. You know, only when I don't do something right, uh, you know, it's pointed out, but there is no encouragement. Um, and sometimes we can get disappointed when we hear people, you know, slandering about us, gossiping about us, putting us down, uh, not, you know, um, uh, you know, not getting our due rewards in terms of promotion or pay hikes or whatever, you know, um, and also some, some of them who have gone into mission fields and ministered and labored hard for years, they have not even seen one convert. You know, uh, we we read the life of uh, uh, missionaries and we see that, you know, they get discouraged when they don't see even one convert after three, four, five years. But uh, we need to know that when we are doing what the Lord uh, has called us to, purpose us to, there will be challenges, there will be difficulties, but what we need to be, uh, our focus should be on, you know, running our race with endurance because there is a crown uh, uh, of life that is waiting for us, there is hope of eternal life and also eternal rewards that we will be uh, given. So, you know, when they say that, uh, there will be judgment for the believers. It does not mean we'll be judged for uh, whether we've done good or bad. No, it's uh, judgment is basically talking about the rewards that we will get for, you know, what we have done to build God's kingdom, how faithful, sincere, how we have persevered, how we have um, endured. So, you know, uh, don't feel... Um, disappointed uh, don't feel of uh, you know uh, many of them uh, give up ministry because they think hey there is no hope there is no encouragement uh, there is uh, uh, you know everything what every time it's just people who are pointing at my negativity what i've not done and it's uh, you know difficult to please people people are slandering gossiping and they want to give up ministry but don't look at people don't look at what you know, um, uh, uh, the challenges, but, you know, there will be challenges, but continue running your race with perseverance and endurance because you know that, you know, there would be a future re heavenly reward that is waiting for us. And what we need to do is work as diligent, good stewards of what God has entrusted to us so that we can hear uh, the King of Kings tell us, well done, uh, my good and faithful servant. Okay, so that is the second uh, uh, significance, ethical significance of resurrection. And, you know, uh, Paul continues to tell us that, you know, in, in, in the book of Romans, that when we have been raised with Christ, he tells us to seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so he's encouraging us to set our minds on things above than on earthly things, because he says our life, you know, for we are dead and our life is now hidden with Christ in uh, God. And when Christ uh, appears, you know, we will also appear with him in glory. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to uh, 4. So, you know, we are seated with Christ, uh, you know, uh, and what is our position now that we are seated at the right hand of God. So we need to set our mind on things above, not things of the earth. 
for you know we our life is now hidden with Christ and when Christ appears we will also appear with him in glory and we will receive our eternal um, reward okay the third ethical uh, application of resurrection is um, you know uh, that we need to stop yielding to sin in our uh, lives and Paul reminds us of this in Romans chapter 6 where he says you know consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus so because of the resurrection of Christ and remember I said his resurrection power is working within us Romans chapter 6 verse 11 the same uh, 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 you know power that raised Christ back from death to life is the same power that is working in us uh, so the same resurrection power is within us just a minute please yeah the same resurrection power is uh, within us and then he goes on to say you know uh, in verses 12 and 13 he says therefore let sin not reign in your mortal bodies do not yield your members of your bodies to sin so he's saying in verse 11 of chapter 6 in Romans that you know um, uh, we have been dead to sin we are made alive to God in Christ Jesus which means we have been resurrected with Christ he's talking about spiritual identification here and he's saying that you know by because Christ is raised up from the dead, we are also alive in Christ Jesus and his resurrection power works within us. And then he goes on to immediately say in verses 12 and 13, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. And he says, do not yield your members to uh, sin. So the fact that we have this new resurrection power uh, in us, as a result of our spiritual identification with Christ's death, his uh, burial, his resurrection, his uh, ascension, and him seated at the right hand of God, his exaltation, you know, uh, and also because of the fact that uh, we are, you know, now uh, 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 accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Uh, we are this new creation and because of that we have this resurrection power that is in us and because this of this resurrection power we can overcome the domination of sin in our lives and uh, hence Paul is saying you know hence you cannot sin anymore or hence you will will not be able to yield to sin anymore and that's why he says sin has no longer power or dominion over you uh, sin has uh, is nullified and you are dead to sin why is he saying that he's saying it because you know spiritually uh, we have been identified with Christ's resurrection and his resurrection power uh, works in us uh, so powerfully that we can overcome the sin in our lives okay so this is briefly uh, you know just some notes that uh, uh, some research that i did and just sharing with you i shared with you the nature of christ's resurrection the doctrinal significance of his resurrection which ensures our regeneration our justification the perfect resurrection bodies as well and also what is the ethical significance of uh, uh, resurrection okay so ethical means what is the the moral or the right uh, significance of uh, resurrection okay how can we apply it in our everyday day-to-day uh, -day lives so this is the uh, just about or just a little bit about the resurrection of Christ and we uh, we see that you know after Christ resurrected you know he um, uh, he ascended back to the father and he's seated at the right hand of God so if you look at Mark chapter 16 uh, verses 19 to 20 I think these references are given in your notes Mark chapter 16 verses 19 to 20 Philippians 2 9 to 11 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 32 uh, so can uh, you know different people read uh, these three verses please Mark 16 19 to 20 
Can someone please read Mark chapter 16, verses 19 to 20? Someone else can read Philippians 2, 9 to 11. And someone else can read 1 Peter 3, 22. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Thank you, Rin. So here we see that, you know, um, after the Lord had appeared to them, spoken to them, he was, you know, received up into heaven where he sat at the right hand of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Can anyone read Philippians 2, 2 9 to for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. By are you the sorry to disturb Chira? Sorry to disturb. Are you reading Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11? Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Uh, yes, sir. Philippians 2, 9. Yes. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you, Chira. So here we see that, you know, uh, God exalted Jesus and gave him the name which is above every uh, name. So after his resurrection, he was exalted. He goes back uh, to where he was before the incarnation. First Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Who has, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. Amen. Thank you, Nina Santosh. So here we see that you now Christ has gone uh, back to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God uh, and is, you know, uh, and has been given. So when, when, when Christ uh, ascended back, uh, to heaven after you know he finished his work here on the earth uh, you know he's gone back to where he was before the incarnation and we see that now he is uh, received back his glory as deity as God and he is seated at the right hand of the father and is above every authority and power and uh, dominion. So we see that he is glorified with the glory he had uh, with the Father even before eternity passed. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 5. And he was and is and will always be the eternal word. Okay, so God incarnate has gone back uh, and has been restored to his former glory of who he was uh, with the Father from eternity past. And he was and is and will always be the eternal God, the eternal uh, word. Okay, So that is uh, chapter 11 for us, where we looked at Christ's um, uh, resurrection and his exaltation. Okay, Any questions on this chapter 11? Before we move on to chapter 12. So I think Nina Santosh had asked a question, sorry, Nina John had asked a question last week, uh, you know, about the glorified bodies. Um, if you look at scripture, you know, it's only, uh, and we look at First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, where we read, you know, where Paul talks about uh, resurrection, he says the dead in Christ will rise and, you know, then we'll all receive glorified bodies. So uh, it's, you know, when somebody dies, they are uh, they're either in, in paradise or, you know, in temporary, uh, those who are non-believers in temporary hell. 
but uh, you know they are just spirit beings but um, when Christ returns the dead in Christ will rise up and they will be joined uh, and they will receive their glorified bodies and all of us will be uh, changed in the twinkling of an eye as it says Paul writes and we will receive our glorified bodies okay so any questions in this chapter If not, uh, we will move on to chapter 12. Again, chapter 12 is very, very short and brief. It's basically because uh, this, uh, this whole chapter about the second coming or the promised return of Christ and the events surrounding uh, the second coming of Christ and the events surrounding of the rapture, after the rapture, and uh, you know uh, when Christ comes back to reign, sorry, in His millennial kingdom for a thousand years, and the and the things that are post the millennium kingdom uh, will all be taught to you in detail uh, on the course, the end times. Uh, you will study that uh, I think in your second year uh, in the spring semester. So. Uh, we are just going to look at it very, very briefly here because you will, you also have, uh, you know, one lesson in uh, doctrinal foundations which talks about, uh, you know, uh, the second coming or the end times. But you will learn about it in very detail uh, in the course, the end times. Okay. So very briefly in this chapter, we know that uh, you know the same Jesus who, after his resurrection, ascended back to heaven the same Jesus will return again. How do we know this? Uh, we read this in Acts chapter 1 verses 9 to 11 where it says, Now when, they, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their uh, sight. So it was Jesus just talking to the disciples, telling them what they needed to do to stay back in Jerusalem, that they will be clothed or endued with power from on high. And even as he spoke to them about things uh, the, of the kingdom of God, you know, they just watched. Uh, they watched the disciples, be, uh, Jesus being taken, disciples watched Jesus being taken up in a cloud. He was, and he was just uh, taken up and he was out of their sight. And in verse 10 it says, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So it's basically angels who said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from, uh, from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So it's, the angels are saying the same Jesus who you saw being taken up from you uh, into heaven, the same manner he will also you will see him coming uh, uh, back, you know, uh, from, you know, you'll see him in the clouds, you'll see him coming uh, back. So we see here that, you know, Jesus' return uh, uh, is sure, uh, is the future hope that we have. Jesus will come back to receive his saints, his believers, this church, who will take, uh, he will take up uh, uh, to be with himself. And this whole event that we we are talking about Christ coming again when he would take away, you know, his saints, his believers, or the church is referred to as the rapture. And this will take place before the seven-year uh, tribulation uh, period. Okay. Um, and there are a few references given. Uh, Ephesians chapter, sorry, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. So can uh, three different people read uh, these uh, scripture passages, please? John 14, 1 to 3, Ephesians 5, 27, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. John 14, 1 to 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, 
there you may be also amen thank you so here we see um, uh, you know uh, that uh, where uh, when christ has gone up you know he is preparing a place for us and he will come back and receive us uh, to himself ephesians 5:27 Ephesians 5.27 That he might present her to himself a glorious church and not having spot or wrinkle, uh, wrinkle or any other, any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Amen. So here is talking about the church. So Christ is going to uh, take up, you know, uh, receive back to himself a glorious church you know, which has no sin, no spot or wrinkle. It's just basically talking about, uh, or blemish talking about sin, but a church that is holy and pure unto the Lord. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. So here basically, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is uh, talking, Apostle Paul is talking about the rapture event and, you know, uh, what will happen during that time, you know, when the Lord himself will descend from heaven uh, with a shout, the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and who, who are, you know, there on the earth will be caught up together with them in the clouds and will meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, so he's comforting them with these um, words. Uh, so the end of, uh, uh, so after the rapture is the seven year uh, tribulation. And after that was the, you know, the 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 war that will happen where, uh, you know, God will, uh, Jesus will put away uh, the nations um, who are supporting Satan, and Satan will be temporarily um, chained for a thousand years, and then this will be the thousand year millennium rule where we will all. Uh, live here on this on this earth and we will enjoy uh, you know uh, uh, just living in that time when God himself will Jesus himself will rule and reign and after the uh, you know uh, the thousand year there will be the final war against Satan where Satan will be thrown forever in the lake of fire and um, you know there will uh, uh, there will be the white throne judgment uh, so that is the events that happens uh, uh, after the uh, the rapture. But uh, I'm not going to go into uh, too many details because it will all be covered in the course on the end times. Uh, so Nina Joy has a question. In the interim period, the believers who go to be with the Lord will have spiritual bodies before resurrection. Yes, uh, you know, that's what scripture says. There will just be spirit beings. Uh, uh, you know, the, because the spirit goes up and then, you know, they will receive their glorified bodies uh, during the rapture because it says the dead in Christ will rise up. And Paul also says those who are in, uh, you know, in the seas, the bodies will, the seas will give up their bodies. So they will, we will all receive glorified bodies. Yes. Any questions? Any other questions anyone has? Um, Pastor, I have a question from uh, John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, which we just read. And um, mm -hmm. so from verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. So um, what does Jesus mean um, by referring to mansions? Does it refer to something else? 
and uh, where he says, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. So what does he mean by that? So it's basically he's going to prepare, a, from what scripture says, is basically he's going to prepare a place for us. Uh, and it says, in my father's house there are many mansions. Uh, so, you know, he's going to prepare a mansion for each one of us. Um, but we do not know what kind of mansions these are. We have no, uh, you know, more clarity or, uh, uh, you know, nothing that talks about what kind of mansions. Also thinking about uh, heaven, whether, you know, we really need to be living in a house because we'll 24-7 be worshipping God. Uh, or we do not know because, but this is what Jesus says. And what he says is truth. And he says, in my father's house are many mansions. So, you know, yes, he's going to prepare a place for each one of us. Does that help? Um, Rin? I mean, yes, Master, but then, like, what you, what you just said, um, like, uh, we'll be worshiping God in heaven forever. So mm. that's what I was thinking. Mm. Why does he need to prepare a place for us? And that's what I just thought. Yeah, that's what, he, that's what even, uh, there's a thought in my mind, but, you know, this is what, uh, uh, this is what Jesus says, you know, uh, that he's preparing a place. Um, and so he's preparing a place. So, so they don't, you know, just assuring the, giving uh, confidence, assuring the disciples uh, that, you know, they are not going to be alone because he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and, you know, because they're basically, he's saying all this is the reason is for calming their troubled heart and also assuring them that the Holy Spirit is going to come and help them and also their future reunion in the Father's uh, uh, house. So just a kind of uh, assurance that is there. Basically, if you look at uh, this word mansion in the ancient Greek, uh, when it's translated in the ancient Greek, it's just basically talking about a dwelling uh, place. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the noun, uh, form of this Greek word, mansion, it's basically a place to um, stay. So, you know, uh, so what God is, Jesus is basically saying is, you know, uh, there is a dwelling place uh, where God dwells that is in heaven and it's, it's a glorious place, it's a beautiful place and hence, you know, you would also be with me uh, in that glorious, uh, beautiful place. So if you look at uh, it in the literal sense of in the English word, mansion here basically means a huge big house with many rooms. But um, if you look at it in the light of, uh, you know, what mansion means in the Greek, it's, uh, you know, translated as a dwelling place. And uh, the noun word of this form uh, uh, of sorry of mansion basically means a place to stay. Uh, so you know it's uh, it's basically talking about heaven as a place where God dwells, where Jesus is also going back to be with His Father, to be back where He was eternally, where He eternally existed there. And he's saying, you would also be with me in that same uh, dwelling place. And uh, it's a glorious uh, mansion. So um, so that is what uh, basically he's meaning to say. So that you will just be in the place where I am uh, and I lived eternally. And you will also be with me there. Is that uh, OK now? Yeah, that's it's fine. Okay. Yes, Nina John. Uh, when we talk about uh, mansions, can we uh, say it? Of course, like you were saying, that it's a dwelling place, and uh, the word that it used is okay. It needs to be really big because um, there are going to be millions and millions of people, right? <laughs> Who's go who are going to be with the Lord? So maybe in that, is it uh, you know good to think about it in that way that 
then there will be, I mean, first of all, a dwelling place, enough place for everybody to stay. I mean, all the believers in Christ. Will that be? Yes. Uh, yeah. Mansions, when you say, because I mean, there's, there would be enough place for everybody dwelling place like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> if you look at it, if we look at it, we, we think about it, it are just a finite minds, but we know that yeah. there is this infinite God and there will be millions upon millions upon millions of people from every tribe, language, nation. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he's God and he can, you know, when uh, he can just accommodate all of us. <laughs> and uh, yes, so that is what, you know. So maybe he's just uh, saying it to encourage uh, these uh, his disciples uh, not to be troubled because there is a dwelling place where God is preparing for them. And he's, yes, he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. So he's using the plural mansions there, maybe because, you know, they must be wondering, you know, so many people, where are they, uh, you know, the disciples be wondering, do we have a place for us, you know? They're already so worried about uh, who will sit at the right hand and the left. <laughs> but, you know, he's saying, you know, there are many mansions, which means God is basically saying, hey, I can accommodate all of you there. Millions upon millions from every tribe, language, tongue and race. Yeah. So they might have smiled or bought, he would have bought some joy on their face and just thinking about that event. They will be excited. Because, you know, they'll think, oh, we have a mansion for ourselves there, you know, basically. Did that help, Nina? John? Yes, thank you. Because he starts <laughs> off by saying that, uh, let not be, they were troubled because he said he was going away, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in contrast to that, he said, let not your hearts be troubled, because where I'm going is where you're going to be too. And the dwelling place, dwelling place always means to be there all the time even now we are supposed to be he that dwelleth in the secret place right so we need to be staying with him all the time even while we are here then we are under the shadow of the almighty right yes even if you look at the word dwell we study yes. tabernacle dwelling of god god pleases to dwell with man so the old testament he dwelt with them in the tabernacle in the new testament he dwells within us our bodies are the temple of the living god in the Most High God dwells within us. So, yes, you know. Um, and he's saying that, um, he's just assuring them that, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'll come back and receive you to myself. Yeah. Yes, anyone has any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the last chapter, uh, the Son of God. There also we just have uh, like about a couple of references that have been given and, uh, you know, just a few points. Uh, but I'm just going to share a little more about uh, the Son of God. Um, so, and then we will come back to look at uh, uh, these scripture passages that has just been mentioned in your notes. So if you look at your notes, it just says, uh, uh, Son of God, the church's foundation, the truth about the Son of God. And then we have Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 to 17. Then uh, we live by faith in the Son of God, Galatians 2, 20. The Son of God is a prototype for the sons and daughters of God. And then a list of uh, uh, references and then it just ends by two statements that are there. So I just thought I'll, I'll add a few more things uh, about um, uh, the Son of God. And this is something that, you know, um, uh, is taken from, uh, you know, past the sermon, the Son of God. So you can go back and listen to it. But I'm just going to give you uh, the basic uh, content of what he has said because it's quite, it's very, very uh, powerful. So if you look at Luke chapter 1, uh, so can somebody please turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 34 to 35? And somebody else can read for us Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And someone else can read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. So can one of you please read Luke chapter 1, verses 34 to 35, please? Then Mary said to the angel, 
How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. Thank you, Rin. So here, uh, you know, the Son of God, taught, uh, who's become God, who's become incarnate, uh, who is the Son of God. Now, who is the Son of God? Uh, we look at who this is, the, who is the Son of God, but we will not look at him, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, in the time and space that we are living, but we will step back and we will step into uh, eternal time, eternal space, and we will look at who the Son of God was in eternity, uh, 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 even before uh, the beginning of time, even before creation, who was the Son of God, even before time began in eternity. So we will just study him uh, in eternity and eternity time and space. Okay, so for that we look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and John chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. So can one of you Please read Genesis 1, 1, and someone else can read John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, please. In the beginning, God... It's Genesis 1, 1, right? Yes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. Someone else can read John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, please. John chapter 1, 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. Thank you, Vimal. So here we see that scripture very clearly states uh, that in the beginning, okay, so... This was the beginning of the created realms, but even before the beginning, there was God. So we are basically studying who the Son of God is. We're looking at him in eternity, eternity in time and space. And we're going to look at scripture references that talk about this eternal God. So we're beginning with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where he's saying that in the beginning, God, you know, created. So God was there. Uh, even before the beginning, and he was the cause of the beginning. So before the beginning, there was God, and God was there before the beginning, and God was the cause of the beginning. So what do scriptures reveal about this God who was there before the beginning? Uh, we will look at a few, uh, you know, scripture passages that reveal to us who is the Son of God, who is this God who was there even before the beginning of time, who lived in eternity. Uh, and so we scripture reveals to us that this God who was there before the beginning was the is the eternal God. He was, he is, he will always be. Okay, so he's the eternal God. And Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. I'm not going to be reading all of the scriptures, but we can just, you can take it down. Uh, you can also go back and listen to the sermon series and refer to the notes. Uh, dot, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27 says that he is the eternal, the eternal God is your our refuge. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27 says the eternal God is your refuge. So scripture reveals to us that the Son of God or this God who was there before the beginning is eternal. He's the eternal God. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 17 says, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So he is the king who is eternal, who is immortal and invisible. Uh, can one of you please read Psalm 90 verse 2 and someone else can read Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28. Psalm 90 verse 2 
And Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, please. Psalms 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. So we see that from everlasting to everlasting, He is God. From eternity past to eternity future, He is everlasting. He is He is God. Okay, Isaiah 40 verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, His understanding is unsearchable. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So here another reference that talks about the eternity of God, the eternal aspect of God, that he is the everlasting uh, God. So he's eternal. He is um, also self-existent, uh, which means that he has life in himself. Uh, John chapter 5 verse 26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. So we know that uh, he is self-existent, uh, uh, the son of God. God is self-existent. He is not dependent on anything for his uh, dependence. He is also infinite. Uh, there is no measure to his attributes. Uh, there is no measure to his greatness. Uh, there is no measure to his power, wisdom and understanding. Uh, and a few scripture references that we can read is uh, Psalm 104, verse 1, Psalm 147, verse 5, and Isaiah chapter 40, verse 18. So can three people read these three references, please? Uh, Psalm 104, verse 1, Psalm 147, verse 5, and Isaiah 40, verse 18. Psalm 104, 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Amen. Thank you, Vimal. So here we see that you know, God is very great. Uh, uh, scripture mentions, us, mentions this to us. Uh, uh, Psalm 147, verse 5. Great and mighty. Yes, Psalm Great. 147, verse 5. Great and mighty is our Lord. His wisdom cannot be measured. Amen. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Amen. Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? Amen. So here we see that there is no measure to his attributes, there's no measure to his greatness, power, wisdom, and understanding. And also we see that, uh, you know, uh, he is a, a wise God, he has all the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. We also know that this God who existed even before uh, the beginning is not only eternal, self-existent, infinite, uh, has all the wisdom, but he's also a triune God. He's a God uh, who uh, exists in three persons, uh, we read this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. So we have the Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but even though they are three persons, they are co-equal, and each one of them fully represents the Godhead. And we also see that Bible reveals to us that this God is the God of glory. Uh, glory is the very nature, the very essence, the very expression of who uh, God is. The glory of God is the expression of all of his attributes, uh, his goodness, his mercy, his truth. And his glory is so precious that God will not share it with any other as we read in Isaiah chapter uh, 40.
we also see that each person of the Godhead, you know, have the glory of God, holds the glory of God, uh, the glory of the Godhead. Each one of them have this glory. Uh, we read this in John chapter 17, verse 5 and 24. And hence, you know, they fully represent the Godhead because each one of them uh, have the glory of God. Uh, in in them and each one of them you know uh, exhibit the attributes of um, who god is even as they manifest the glory because each one of them have the glory of god we'll stop here we'll come back and we we'll look at more aspects about who the son of god was who lived in eternity even before time uh, began okay we'll um, take a break now and then we'll come back and join and look ahead in this class thank you everyone